Welcome to the Bible and Christianity Iceberg. In this video, we'll be covering a good amount of religious topics, but I have to preface this iceberg with a warning, sorta. First, is that the original creator of the iceberg did not explain any of these topics, basically leaving me and everybody else to fill in the iceberg for him and to guess and interpret what these entries initially meant. Second, I'm gonna go into more depth with explanations here than in my previous videos, because the Bible's full of symbolic speech, and that makes understanding a good amount of things said in it a bit difficult the first time around. So I'll try and speak in a way that really hammers down the explanations. With that said, I'm sure that this is going to be the most interesting video yet, and I thank you all for the support like always. I want to hit 10,000 on this channel by the end of 2025, so if you enjoy content such as this, feel free to leave a like and subscribe, and now, let's get into it. Starting off with Tier 1, The Incarnate Word of God. The term incarnate word of God typically refers to the Christian theological concept of the incarnation. In Christian belief, the incarnation refers to the central doctrine that the second person of the Holy Trinity, the Son, took on a human flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. The idea is rooted in various biblical passages, especially in the New Testament. The Gospel of John in particular emphasizes the concept of the word becoming flesh. So I'll read John 1.14 and it says that, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. This verse is often interpreted to mean that Jesus Christ, referred to as the word of God, became incarnate, taking on human form to dwell among humanity. The incarnate is a fundamental doctrine in many Christian traditions, signifying God's direct intervention in human history through Jesus Christ. Gog and Magog. In the Bible, Gog and Magog are mentioned in the book of Ezekiel, specifically in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Here, they're depicted as nations or peoples who will come against the people of Israel in a future end time scenario. The passages in Ezekiel describe a prophetic vision where God speaks to the prophet Ezekiel about a great battle involving Gog, the chief prince of Magog, and a coalition of other nations. Gog is described as a leader or chief prince of the land of Magog. The exact identity of Gog is not specified in the text and scholars have debated who or what Gog represents. Some interpretations suggest that Gog might be a symbolic figure representing a future enemy of Israel, while others propose historical or regional identifications. Magog is the land that Gog comes from, but again we don't know what Magog is and it's also associated with regions or nations located to the north of Israel. So yeah, another prophetic placeholder, a lot of these are going to be on the list. Longinus Longinus in Christian tradition is the name often given to the Roman soldier who according to the Gospel of John pierced the side of Jesus with a lance during the crucifixion. The Gospel narrative presents Longinus as a witness to the events surrounding Jesus' death, and his piercing of Jesus' side is described as a fulfillment of prophecy. And after this act, Longinus reportedly declared that Jesus was the Son of God. So the soldier's lance Longinus is sometimes referred to as the Holy Lance or the Spear of Destiny and Longinus is venerated as a saint in some Christian traditions, particularly the Eastern Orthodox Church, and his feast day is celebrated on March 15th. The Trinity in the Old Testament. So I'll break this down in a different way. There's this Christian doctrine of the Holy Trinity, which teaches that there is one God who exists in three persons, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is primarily like a, a New Testament concept, but the Old Testament, which is part of the Hebrew Bible, does not explicitly articulate the doctrine of the Trinity in the same way that it is developed in Christian theology. However, some Christians have found foreshadowings, hints, or indications of the Trinity in the Old Testament through various passages and concepts. However, it is important to note that these interpretations are not universally accepted within Christianity and are subject to theological interpretation. People can have their own thoughts on it. But some passages in the Old Testament use plural language when referring to God. For example, in Genesis 1.26, God says, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. And while this could be interpreted as a reference to the triune nature of God, it's also consistent with the use of royal we in ancient texts. So yeah, that's where the Trinity in the Old Testament theory kind of comes from. Have You can have your own thoughts on it, but I'm just filling in the blanks of this iceberg. The Golden Jerusalem Cube The description of the Golden Cube in the context of the New Jerusalem originates from the Book of Revelation, which is the final book of the Christian Bible. 
In Revelation 21, 15 through 21, the visionary John describes an angel measuring the heavenly city with a golden reed. This city is laid out as a perfect square with each side measuring 12,000 stadia. Stadia being a form of measurement, let's just assume it's huge because it's a whole city, of course. And the city itself is constructed of pure gold as clear as glass. This golden cube is a symbolic representation of the New Jerusalem, and it's like a very important city that holds a lot of significance in the Christian end times because it's supposed to be a city that holds all those who are redeemed and basically who Jesus like chooses to protect during the end times. I do think the city is meant to be literally gold, but you can interpret the use of gold and the city not actually being gold, but more of a representation of the divine purity, beauty, significance, and per perfection of God's kingdom. Very hard to describe there, but I hope I got that one down. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years. So this passage is often quoted in discussions about time, eternity, and God's perspective on time. This is just to emphasize the timelessness and eternity of God and suggest that God's understanding of time is different from that of human beings. Another way to perceive this line is basically saying that when you're in heaven or in God's perspective, one day to him is a thousand years to us. So again, it emphasizes how long the dude has been around and yeah. Balaam's donkey. So on the journey, an angel of the Lord stood in the path of Balaam's donkey, and only the donkey could see the angel. The donkey stopped and refused to go any further, which was frustrating Balaam. Balaam struck the donkey three times in response, and at this point, the Bible says, Then the Lord opened the donkey's mouth, and she said to Balaam, What have I done to you to make you beat me three times? After this, they had a brief conversation, and the Lord opened Balaam's eyes. Then he saw the angel standing in the way. The angel then explained that the donkey has saved Balaam's life by not moving forward into the angel's path. Balaam realized his anger and acknowledged his need to speak only what God commanded. This story is often cited as like divine intervention and communication in the Bible. And it also serves to illustrate God's ability to use like weird and unconventional means to convey his message. Psalm 82. Psalm 82 is one of the psalms found in the Hebrew Bible, which is the Old Testament. This is a relatively short psalm consisting of eight verses, and it's often considered a divine counsel psalm. The divine counsel psalms typically describe a scene in which God presides over a heavenly assembly or council of divine beings. And in this psalm, God is depicted as presiding over an assembly of divine beings, often referred to as gods or sons of the Most High. Make a mental note of that for the rest of this iceberg. This psalm raises the issue of divine justice and condemns these divine beings for failing to defend the weak, fatherless, the poor, and the oppressed. The psalm emphasizes the importance of impartiality, righteousness, and the ultimate judgment of God, and it concludes with a plea for God to rise up and finally judge the earth. Prophets walk the earth. This is self-explanatory, but I'll get into it a little bit. Some Christian traditions believe that the prophetic gift has continued beyond the Old Testament period. They hold that Prophets can exist in the present day and receive messages from God, but these modern prophets are not typically viewed as adding to the authoritative biblical canon. Rather, their messages are often seen as providing guidance, encouragement, or insights for the contemporary church. It is important to note that not all Christian denominations or traditions hold the view that prophets continue to walk the earth today, of course. In many mainstream Christian denominations, the era of biblical prophecy is seen as having concluded with the writing of the New Testament. So that results in much skepticism about the claims of modern day prophets. Many Christian traditions that believe in the continuation of prophetic gifts also emphasize the importance of testing and discernment. They encourage believers to evaluate the authenticity of prophetic messages and to ensure that they align with biblical teachings and the character of God. Overall, this belief that quote unquote, the prophets walk the earth in Christianity is not really uniform currently and can vary widely based on theological convictions and denominational affiliations. The views on prophecy, the role of modern day prophets and the testing of these prophetic messages can differ significantly from one Christian tradition to another. The apocalypse locust will be an alien invasion. So there's an idea that 
an apocalyptic event involving locusts might be interpreted as an alien invasion. And this is because in the book of Revelation within the Christian Bible, there is a mention of locusts as a part of apocalyptic symbolism. And in Revelation 9, it's stated that they are creatures that emerge during the end times causing destruction and torment. And combine this with the Bible being full of symbolism rather than like literal statements, people are not really sure what locusts are going to be when this, you know, end time comes. So there have been some theories that it's going to be an alien invasion rather than like real locusts. And of course, people say alien invasion because when people imagine aliens, they have traits similar to locusts. However, whatever locusts may be in the book of Revelations to you, interpret it as such, for none of us truly know yet. Two powers in heaven. So the concept of two powers in heaven reflects a theological discourse that emerged in both Jewish and early Christian thought. Within the framework of Jewish mysticism and certain pre-Christian texts, there are indications of the existence of two distinct divine powers in heaven. Alan Segel in his book, Two Powers in Heaven, has a great explanation of this. In it, he argues that in the Second Temple Judaism, there was a belief in two gods or two Yahwehs, one an invisible spirit and the other visible, often in human form. At times, these two Yahwehs appear together in text, at times being distinguished, other times not. This was apparently an accepted teaching in Judaism in that it didn't contradict the monotheism since both figures were equally Yahweh. While this is clearly condemned in the Mishnah, there is evidence that it was actually accepted up until the second century when it was declared heretical due to its closeness to Christian teachings about Jesus. The Beloved Disciple The Beloved Disciple is a mysterious figure in the Gospel of John, one of the four canonical Gospels in the New Testament. Referred to as the one whom Jesus loved, this disciple's identity remains undisclosed within the text, leading to various interpretations and speculations. Christian tradition has often associated the beloved disciple with the Apostle John, but the Gospel itself doesn't explicitly confirm this identification. The absence of a specific name for this beloved disciple has led to scholarly discussions and different theories as to who this figure might be. The use of this title has become a notable aspect of the narrative, contributing to the complexity of the Gospel of John. In the Gospel, the beloved disciple is depicted as having a close and intimate relationship with Jesus, being present at significant events such as the Last Supper and the Crucifixion. The narrative implies a special connection between Jesus and this disciple, emphasizing a unique bond. The beloved disciple is particularly noted for being the first to recognize Jesus after the resurrection. The ambiguity surrounding the identity of this beloved disciple adds a layer to the Gospel of John, and scholars continue to explore the implications and significance of this enigmatic figure within the broader context of early Christian literature. The Witch of Endor The Witch of Endor is a figure from the Old Testament, found in the first book of Samuel. She lived in the town of Endor and had divinatory abilities. The story involves King Saul seeking her help in summoning the spare of the deceased prophet, Samuel. Despite the risk, Saul facing dire circumstances and rejection by God was desperate for guidance. At Saul's request, the Witch of Endor summoned Samuel's spare. The spare prophesied Saul's impending defeat and death. So this account is often discussed regarding biblical perspectives on divination, necromancy, and the consequences of seeking supernatural guidance outside of God's approval. The story has theological implications and influences discussions on acceptable spiritual practices within the Judeo-Christian tradition. The Book of Enoch The Book of Enoch is an ancient Jewish religious work attributed to Enoch, the great-grandfather of Noah. The Book of Enoch is a collection of several distinct works, each with its own themes and style, and it is considered part of the apocalyptic literature of the Second Temple period. One prominent section within the Book of Enoch is the Book of Watchers, which describes fallen angels, their interactions with humans, and the consequences of said actions. Another key component is the Book of Parables, which presents apocalyptic visions and revelations. The Book of Enoch is not included in canonical scriptures of Judaism or most branches of Christianity. Zipporah at the Inn Incident in Exodus the reference to Zipporah at the end is likely related to a brief episode in the book of Exodus in the Old Testament of the Bible. This account involves Moses, his wife Zipporah, and their son during the journey to Egypt. In Exodus 4.24-26, it is mentioned that while on the way to Egypt, the Lord sought to kill Moses, and Zipporah responded by circumcising their son and touching Moses' feet with the removed foreskin, saying, Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. 
The exact meaning of this passage has been the subject of many debates, and of course, interpretations vary. It appears that there was a divine displeasure or threat against Moses, possibly because he had not circumcised his son, and this was commanded by God in the covenant with Abraham, which is why he may be displeased with Moses, and Zipporah's action is seen as a corrective response to avert the divine anger. This episode is a relatively brief but intriguing part of the larger narrative of Moses' call and mission to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. The Antichrist The Antichrist, as described in Christian end times, is a figure of force that opposes or stands in direct opposition to Christ and his teachings. While the term Antichrist is found in the Epistles of John in the New Testament, 1 John 2.18, 2.22, 4.3, and 2 John 1.7, the detailed characteristics and actions of the Antichrist are often drawn from apocalyptic passages in the book of Revelation and other prophetic writings. The actions of the Antichrist are believed to unfold during the end times period and common themes include deception, false miracles, and the establishment of a counterfeit kingdom that mimics the divine order. The Antichrist is often portrayed as a charismatic and persuasive leader who gains widespread support but leads people away from the true path of righteousness. In the book of Revelation describes a final confrontation between the forces of good and evil, where the Antichrist aligns with other malevolent powers against Christ and his followers. And with that we conclude tier 1, and now we are going to move on to tier 2. Descent into Hades The descent into Hades, also known as the harrowing of hell, is a theological concept in Christian traditions, especially within the Eastern Orthodox, Catholic, and some Protestant beliefs. The idea centers on the period between Jesus Christ's death on the cross and his resurrection. And although the phrase descent into Hades is not explicitly said or found in the Bible, it is associated with biblical themes. According to this belief, after his crucifixion, Jesus descended into the realm of the dead, which is Hades, to proclaim victory over sin and death. During this descent, he is said to have liberated the souls of the righteous who had died before his resurrection, including figures from the Old Testament. This event is seen as part of the larger narrative of Christ's redemptive work, demonstrating his triumph over the powers of death and evil. The descent into Hades is often connected to passages in the New Testament, such as 1 Peter 3 18-20, which speaks of Christ preaching to the spirits of prison. While the exact details of this event are not explicitly outlined in the Bible, the theological significance lies in the belief that Christ's redemptive work extends beyond his crucifixion and resurrection, encompassing the entire scope of human existence, both in life and in death. The Horn of Moses So, in the Bible, particularly in the book of Exodus, when Moses descended from Mount Sinai after receiving the Ten Commandments, his face was said to be radiant. The Hebrew word used for radiant can also be translated as horned. This is not to be taken literally, rather, it symbolizes the shining or radiant appearance of Moses' face as a result of his encounter with God. So I think what this entry gets at is, Moses had horns for a brief period of time after he met God. The throne of God is sentient. So this entry delves into the intriguing idea of a sentient throne within biblical imagery, presenting a concept where the throne traditionally seen as an inanimate object takes a profound sense of awareness and consciousness. This interpretation, rooted in prophetic and visionary texts, suggests that the throne is not a passive seat, but actually an active participant in the divine order. The notion of a sentient throne is explored within the context of passages that emphasize the throne as more than a symbol of authority, but rather a living presence intimately connected to divine judgment. The Mark of Cain The Mark of Cain is a biblical concept derived from the story of Cain and Abel in the book of Genesis. According to this story, Cain and Abel were the sons of Adam and Eve, and out of jealousy and anger, Cain murdered his brother Abel. In response to this act, God confronted Cain and pronounced a curse upon him. To protect Cain from potential harm, God placed a mark on him, commonly referred to as the mark of Cain. So the Bible does not provide like an explicit intricate explanation about the nature of this mark, leaving it open to interpretation. However, most have come to believe that this is a mark of guilt and shame and a warning to others. The 120 year life limit. The reference to a 120 year life limit is often associated with a specific verse in the Bible, specifically Genesis 6 3. In the context of the story of Noah and the great flood, in this verse it is stated, Then the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with humans forever, for they are mortal. Their days will be 120 years. The interpretation of this verse has been a subject of debate amongst readers of the Bible for a long time. 
While some have suggested that this verse indicates a limit on the human lifespan of 120 years, others argue that it refers to the time remaining before the flood would come. According to the biblical narrative, after this declaration, Noah was chosen to build the ark, and the floodwaters came when he was about 600 years old. But people don't really believe in like this meaning 120 years is a human life limit because there are entries of people who live longer than 120 years in the Bible even after this declaration. King Abgar King Abgar, often identified as Abgar V, was a historical figure associated with the legend of the Abgar dynasty in Edessa, a city located in modern-day Turkey. According to the tradition, Abgar V was a ruler who reigned in the 1st century AD. He is perhaps best known for the correspondent he is said to have with Jesus Christ. The legend found in early Christian texts suggests that King Abgar, who was afflicted with a serious illness, heard of Jesus' miraculous healing abilities. Desiring to be cured, Abgar sent a letter to Jesus, inviting him to come to Edessa. In some versions of the story, it is mentioned that Abgar heard about Jesus through Thaddeus, one of the twelve apostles, or through others who had witnessed Jesus' powers. According to the narrative, Jesus responded to Abgar's letter, declining the invitation to visit in person but promising that after his ascension, he would send one of his disciples to heal the king. This disciple being Thaddeus. The story of the correspondence between these two has been preserved in various versions and is known as the Letter of Abgar. Neanderthals were not created in God's image. So the question of whether Neanderthals were created in God's image is a theological and philosophical matter that varies amongst religious traditions and individual beliefs. In many mainstream interpretations of Christian theology, the idea of humans being created in the image of God is often associated with the biblical narrative found in Genesis 1, 26 through 27. This is where it states, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. When considering Neanderthals, who are a distinct human species that coexisted with Homo sapiens, theological perspectives may differ. Some people adhere to the view that the concept of being created in God's image is exclusive to Homo sapiens, while others argue for a broader interpretation that includes other hominin species. So again, some may see the idea of being created in God's image as a spiritual or moral quality unique to Homo sapiens, while others may entertain the possibility of extending this concept to other hominin species. The Book of Jubilees The Book of Jubilees, also known as the Little Genesis, or Lesser Genesis is an ancient Jewish religious work that expands upon the narrative of the book of Genesis in the Hebrew Bible. People consider this to be a work contributed to a biblical figure, but not included in the canonical scriptures. Believed to have been written in the Second Temple period, likely in the second century BCE, the book of Jubilees presents a chronological retelling of the events in Genesis, starting with the creation of the world, extending to the time of Moses receiving the law on Mount Sinai. The book is structured around the framework of Jubilee cycles, each lasting 49 years, providing a unique perspective on the biblical narrative. The Forbidden True Name of God In various religious traditions, there is a sense of reverence and sanctity associated with the name of God. Different cultures and religious communities may use various titles, designations, or substitute names for God, reflecting a deep respect for the divine. In Judaism, the name of God is often represented by the Tetragrammaton YHWH. It is considered so sacred that its correct pronunciation is traditionally withheld. When reading the Hebrew scriptures, devout readers may use substitutes such as Adonai, which means Lord, instead of pronouncing the actual divine name. This practice is rooted in a deep reverence for the divine in the Lord and a desire to avoid any casual or irreverent use of the God's name. But yeah, that's just one example of many. But if you notice, we never really use the Lord's true name. Melchizedek. Melchizedek, a mysterious figure appearing in the Bible, is notably featured in the book of Genesis, serving as both a priest and king of Salem. Melchizedek emerges in the narrative without genealogical context. In Genesis 14, 18 through 20, he blesses the patriarch Abraham and receives a tithe from him, establishing an enigmatic and significant presence. The absence of detailed origins and the combination of the Hebrew words for my king and righteousness in his name, Melchizedek, only contributes to the mystery and intrigue surrounding this character. The significance of Melchizedek extends even beyond Genesis, 
as he's referenced in the Psalms, particularly in Psalm 110.4, where a Messianic figure is scripted as a perpetual priest in the order of Melchizedek. The connection gains prominence in the New Testament, especially in the letter to the Hebrews. Hebrews 7 expounds on the typology of Melchizedek, presenting him as a prefiguration of Christ. The author underscores the superiority of Christ's priesthood over the Levitical priesthood using Melchizedek as a symbolic bridge between the Old and New Testaments. Bullinger's Five Crosses The Five Crosses, known as Les Chincroy in French, constitute an historic ensemble of stone crosses situated in Brittany, France, designated as a historic monument by decree on December 7, 1925. These crosses are collectively attributed to the 18th century, although the central cross is said to date back further, with various accounts proposing origins in the 15th or 16th century. Each cross is distinct, but they share a common significance, standing as silent witnesses to history. The central cross, elevated on a tall pillar, bears depictions of both Christ and Mary, setting it apart from others. A cross adjacent to the central one displays the date, 1728, while the base of another cross is inscribed with 1733. Differing narratives surround the origin of these crosses, with local lore suggesting that they were erected to commemorate a victory over English invaders. Other accounts propose that the crosses were gathered and assembled by the church's rector, either to protect them from destruction or conjunction with a religious mission, possibly in 1728 or 33. Now, this is where Bullinger comes in. Bullinger attributes special significance to this collection of five crosses at Brittany, France. He asserted that they confirmed this theory of challenging the traditional understanding of Jesus' crucifixion positing that Jesus was crucified with four rather than two criminals, two thieves, and two other malefactors. While the cross's historical religious context is rooted in Brittany's local history, Bullinger's interpretation adds a unique layer of theological significance to this ensemble. So yeah, Bullinger believes that with the five crosses, these five crosses actually mean that there were five, well, four other people next to Jesus when he was crucified, not only two. Greek gods in the Bible. While the Bible predominantly focuses on the worship of one true God, Yahweh, there are instances in the New Testament where references to Greek gods are made, reflecting the cultural milieu of the time. One example is the mention of Hermes in the book of Acts during Paul's missionary journey. The townspeople of Lystra, upon witnessing the healing of a paralyzed man by Paul and Barnabas, mistook the missionaries for gods. They identified Paul as Hermes, the Greek messenger god, due to his eloquence in speaking. Similarly, Barnabas was thought to be Zeus, the chief god of lightning and thunder. In this encounter, the local people intended to offer sacrifices to Paul and Barnabas, but the missionaries emphasizing their humanity and the worship of the living god prevented the pagan rites. Another reference occurs in Acts 28.11, where the ship carrying Paul on his way to Rome has a figurehead depicting the twin gods, Castor and Pollux. These gods were believed to bring good luck and protection for sailors. Furthermore, the Bible indirectly touches on the goddess of Aphrodite in Philippians 2.25. This is where Epaphroditus is mentioned. Although not explicitly named, Epaphroditus' name, meaning belonging to Aphrodite, reflects the incorporation of the goddess' name into his own. However, the narrative highlights the transformative power of the gospel, emphasizing that Epaphroditus, once associated with a false deity, now belonged to Jesus through the new birth. So yeah, they're referenced. The Greek gods are referenced in the Bible. However, the Bible makes sure to correct their like existence. They try to just write them off ASAP. With that said, let's close out tier two. And now we are going to enter tier three. The Septuagint. The Septuagint, a monumental translation of the Hebrew scriptures into ancient Greek, stands as a testament to the cultural and linguistic intersections of the Hellenistic world in the third and second centuries BCE. The name Septuagint itself reflects the legendary account that 70 or 72 Jewish scholars representing each of the 12 tribes of Israel independently translated the Hebrew scriptures into Greek in Alexandria, Egypt. This translation was a response to the needs of the Jewish community in Alexandria, which primarily spoke Greek. The legendary narrative underscores the divine nature of the undertaking, claiming that each scholar produced an identical translation, thereby affirming the divine approval of the work. The Septuagint encompasses the book of the Hebrew Bible, with its arrangement and content sometimes differing from the traditional Hebrew Masoretic text. 
The Septuagint also includes additional books known as the Deuterocanonical or Apocryphal books, which are not a part of the canonical Hebrew scriptures accepted by most Jewish traditions. This distinction contributed to the divergence of the biblical canons of different religious communities. The influence of the Septuagint on early Christianity is profound, as many New Testament authors writing in Greek quoted from or alluded to Septuagint rather than a Masoretic text. It also played a pivotal role in shaping early Christian theology and interpretations of Old Testament prophecies concerning Jesus. While the Septuagint continued to be influential in certain Christian traditions, its significance is nuanced across religious communities. YHWH is an onomatopoeia. So the term YHWH is often considered a tetragrammaton, which is a four-letter word representing the name of God of Israel in the Hebrew Bible. In this context, it is not typically described as an onomatopoeia, an onomatopoeia referring to words that imitate the sound they represent, such as buzz or meow. Yahweh, or YHWH, however, is a representation of the sacred name of God in written form, and its pronunciation is traditionally avoided and remains uncertain. In the Hebrew scriptural tradition, the name YHWH is significant because it is associated with God's self-revelation to Moses in the burning bush narrative in the book of Exodus. And this is like Exodus 3, 14, 15. When Moses asks for God for his name, God responds with, Eye Asher Eye. And this is traditionally interpreted as I am who I am, or I will be what I will be. The tetragrammaton Yahweh, or YHWH, is derived from this phrase. Due to its sacred nature, people historically avoid pronunciating the name. However, they will just use the substitute titles such as Adonai or Lord. Lost Early Heretical Text So throughout history, certain writings were deemed heretical by religious authorities because they would deviate from the accepted doctrines. Early Christian communities sought to establish a canon of authoritative texts, and texts that did not align with orthodox teachings were labeled as heretical. Key decisions on the canonical scriptures were made in councils like the Council of Nicaea in 325 CE, shaping the trajectory of Christian orthodoxy. As a result, texts considered heretical were often actively suppressed and in some instances destroyed to maintain theological uniformity. In more recent times, there has been a resurgence of interest in recovering these lost or suppressed texts. Archaeological findings such as the Nag Hammadi Library discovered in Egypt in 1945 brought to light a collection of Gnostic texts that were considered heretical by early Orthodox authorities. These texts, like the Gnostic Gospels and the Gospels of Thomas, provide valuable insights into alternative Christian perspectives and the diversity of thought within early Christian communities. Julius Caesar predicted by Daniel. In Daniel 11, 17 to 19, there's an interesting perspective connecting biblical prophecy to historical events involving Julius Caesar. The passage seems to hint at the political dynamics between Cleopatra and Julius Caesar. Some people interpret this as symbolic representation of the events leading to their alliance and subsequent conflicts reflecting the complex power struggles of their specific era. And to understand this, we need to look at the broader context of Daniel 11, which traces the rise and falls of various kingdoms, eventually leading to a power struggle between the king of the north and the king of the south. And it becomes even more nuanced with Antiochus the Great, who after subduing Egypt, faced unexpected challenges from the rising power of Rome. The subsequent defeat of Antiochus by the Romans aligns with historical events, symbolizing the ascendancy of Julius Caesar and its impact on the political landscape. So from what I've found, apparently this entry is supposed to say that Daniel 11 represents what happened in history with Antiochus the Great and Julius Caesar, and it just aligns perfectly. Only the Father Knows the Day of Judgment So the statement, Only the Father Knows the Day of Judgment, is rooted in a biblical passage found in the New Testament, specifically in the teachings of Jesus. The phrase is a part of the Jesus discourse about the end times and the coming of the kingdom of God, and it emphasizes the unknowable nature of the exact timing of the final judgment. The specific verse is found in the Gospel of Matthew, where Jesus says, But about that day or hour no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Matthew 24, 36. This statement underscores the mysterious and divine aspect of God's plan for the culmination of history. The theological implication is that the timing of the final judgment is known only to God the Father. Even Jesus, in his earthly ministry, did not possess this knowledge. This verse 
has been interpreted in various ways within Christian theology, emphasizing the sovereignty and omniscience of God and the call for believers to remain vigilant and prepared for the eventual return of Christ. The Lost Teachings of Mother Mary The concept of the Lost Teachings of Mother Mary generally refers to the idea that Mary, the mother of Jesus, may have had additional teachings or insights that were not recorded in the canonical Gospels of the New Testament. However, it's important to note that this notion is only speculative and not really supported by anything. The Gospels of the New Testament, such as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, provide the primary accounts of life, teachings, and actions of Jesus Christ, but they offer limited information about Mary's own teachings. Mary is often depicted in the Gospels as a central figure in the events surrounding Jesus' birth, upbringing, and ministry, but her specific teachings and insights were not really recorded, so this has allowed people to speculate that you know they they're missing because if she's jesus mother and she plays a central figure why are there no teachings or insights from her in summary the idea of the lost teachings of mother mary is more of a speculative concept than a historical reality the dna in adam's rib so this entry is kind of quick and it is an interesting question it's that if eve were made with adam's rib their dna should hypothetically be the same so this should result in Eve being a man, not a woman. So this is where this whole entry comes from. It basically questions why Eve is not a boy. If there was like an insensitivity within the DNA or God just tweaked it or whatever. Or if God even needed Adam's rib to... That's what all this comes from. It's basically asking why is Eve a girl if she was created from the same exact DNA that Adam has. Because of course that should generate another Adam. The New Jerusalem will be a cube. So this goes over the previous entry in the first tier where I said Jerusalem will become like a huge golden cube in the city of perfection. All of that is this entry. It's really the same thing. I just kind of put the information from this one into the first one because they were damn near the same exact entry. Renegade Angels of Death. So for this entry, I came up empty. I really tried to find anything on this topic, but everything I'd find would argue the exact contrary to the existence of an angel of death in the first place. And reminder, the creator of the iceberg did not even place any links to research any of his entries, which is kind of frustrating. Lost Writings of Papias. The Lost Writings of Papias refers to the works of the Papias of Hierapolis, an early Christian bishop and writer whose writings have not survived in their complete form. Papias, who lived in the late 1st and early 2nd century CE, is known primarily through references and quotations by later Christian writers, particularly Euspius of Caesarea. Papias is traditionally attributed with a five-volume work titled Exposition of the Sayings of the Lord. In this work, he is said to have collected and recording the sayings and teachings of Jesus as relayed to him by individuals who had direct contact with the apostles. The writing of papyrus are considered quite valuable for insights into the early Christian traditions and the transmission of oral traditions about Jesus. Unfortunately, his works have been lost over time and what remains are fragments and references preserved in the works of later authors. St. Paul and the Merkaba St. Paul, a significant figure in early Christianity, had a spiritual profound experience on the road to Damascus where he encountered the risen Christ. To understand this experience, we have to look at St. Paul's personal practices of prayer and mystical engagement, and during St. Paul's time, there was a mystical tradition called Merkaba mysticism, which focused on visionary experiences related to the divine throne chariot described in Ezekiel's vision. Merkaba mysticism, while not explicitly stated within the Bible or even mentioned, was a part of the religious landscape during St. Paul's era. St. Paul's own experiences, particularly his vision of Christ, display similarities with the mystical practices associated with Merkaba. In 2 Corinthians 12, 1-6, St. Paul describes a visionary encounter using language reminiscent of Merkaba sources, such as ascending to the third heaven and hearing angelic utterances. So I guess the connection in St. Paul and the Merkaba lies in the shared elements of contemplative prayer, visionary experiences, and encounters with divine realities. St. Paul's engagement with mystical practices, likely influenced by the broader spiritual milieu of his time, does provide a backdrop for understanding his unique encounter with Christ. And with this, we exit out of tier 3, and now we get into tier 4. Simon Magus 
Simon Magus, also known as Simon the Sorcerer, is a figure mentioned in the New Testament, particularly in the book of Acts, Acts 8, 9 through 24. Simon is described as a magician or sorcerer from the city of Samaria. Simon practiced sorcery and amazed the people with his magical abilities, claiming to be someone great. According to the narrative in Acts, when the apostles Peter and John came to Samaria to proclaim the gospel and pray for the reception of the Holy Spirit, Simon witnessed the visible effects of the Holy Spirit being imparted through the laying on of hands. Fascinated by this power, Simon offered money to the apostles, hoping to purchase the ability to confer the Holy Spirit. This led to Peter's strong rebuke, stating that the gift of God could not be bought with money and condemning Simon for thinking he could manipulate spiritual matters with material wealth. While the biblical account does not provide extensive details about Simon Magus, later Christian traditions and early Christian writings expanded on this story. Simon is often portrayed as a heretical figure who opposed the apostles and sought to create his own version of Christianity. The term simony is derived from Simon Magus and refers to the act of buying or selling spiritual things, particularly the selling of elastical offices or privileges. Simon Magus is considered by some to be an early example of someone who's trying to use material means to gain spiritual power, and his story does serve as a cautionary tale in Christian theology. The Two Witnesses The Two Witnesses is a concept mentioned in the book of Revelation, the last book of the New Testament in the Bible, and this passage describes two individuals who are given special powers by God, and they play a significant role during the end times. According to Revelation, the two witnesses are clothed in sackcloth, symbolizing mourning or repentance. They are given authority to prophecy for about 1,260 days, during which they perform miraculous acts. They have the power to shut off the sky, preventing rain. They can turn water into blood. They also have the ability to strike the earth with plagues as often as they wish. The two witnesses face opposition from the beast that ascends from the bottomless pit. This beast, often associated with evil forces, overcomes and kills the two witnesses. Their dead bodies lie in the street of the great city, identified symbolically as Sodom and Egypt, and people from various nations see their bodies for three and a half days. During this time, the inhabitants of earth celebrate their deaths. However, after three and a half days, the breath of life from God enters the two witnesses, and they are resurrected, standing on their feet. This event will cause great fear amongst those who will witness it for obvious reasons. Jesus is the destroyer of gods. So this entry is very interesting when you hear it out from Dr. Michael Heiser, but I can quickly summarize what he says using the scriptures that he provides in his video. Isaiah 34, 1-4, both the earthly nation and the heavenly host behind them are judged on the day of the Lord. Isaiah 24, 21, on that day, the Lord will punish the host of heaven in heaven and the king of earth on earth. They'll be gathered up together. They will be shut up in a prison, and after many days, they will be punished. Then Corinthians 15, 24, here comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God, the Father, after destroying every rule, every authority, and every power. And summarizing and wrapping up all these scriptures together, when it comes to the terminology of both rule and authority, he references all forms of said rule and authority, even the supernatural, i.e. the hosts of heaven. So this culminates into an interpretation of Jesus, eventually destroying not only all of the leaders on earth, but the heavenly hosts behind them. If you want a better explanation, again, I suggest checking out Michael Heiser's video. It will be in the description below. We will judge angels. The idea that humans will judge angels is derived from a passage in the New Testament, specifically from the writings of the Apostle Paul. In 1 Corinthians 6.3, Paul writes, do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? So the context of this statement is a discussion by Paul about disputes among believers that were taken to secular courts for resolution. Paul expresses disapproval of this and suggests that Christians should be able to settle such matters within the faith community. In the process, he makes a broader statement about the future roles of believers in judging, including angels. The precise nature of what it means for believers to judge angels is not elaborated on in this passage, however, interpretations may vary. This is what I have for, we like humans will judge angels. I don't know what the creator meant, so if anybody has any other ideas, put them down below. The New Earth 
The idea of the new earth in Christian theology is drawn from biblical passages, particularly the book of Revelation. According to Revelation 21, 1-4, the current earth and heavens will pass away, and a new heaven and a new earth will be ushered in. This creation is depicted as the holy city, the new Jerusalem descending from heaven. In this renewed reality, God will dwell among humanity, wiping away all tears, eradicating death, mourning, and pain. It symbolizes a state of eternal communion between God and his people, free from the imperfection and the suffering of the current world. Isaiah 65, 17, an Old Testament prophecy aligns with this vision, emphasizing the creation of new heavens and a new earth by God. I did go over this. Um, it's connected to like the Golden Jerusalem Cube. Same topic. Paul's thorn in the flesh. The phrase thorn in the flesh refers to a metaphorical expression used by the Apostle Paul in the New Testament, specifically in 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. In 2 Corinthians, Paul speaks of being given a thorn in the flesh, which is a messenger of Satan, and this is to torment him. The nature of this thorn is not explicitly specified, leading to various interpretations and speculations. Some suggest that it could be a physical ailment or a reoccurring challenge or opposition from others. Regardless of its nature, Paul describes it as a source of distress. Paul recounts that he pleaded with the Lord three times to remove the thorn, but the thorn responded, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And then Paul acknowledges that he will boast in his weaknesses for when he's weak, he's strong in the strength of Christ. Interpretations of Paul's thorn in the flesh may vary amongst many people. Some view it as a humbling physical affliction, while others see it as a metaphor for various trials and difficulties in Paul's life. The key takeaway from this passage specifically is the emphasis on God's grace and power being sufficient enough to sustain believers through challenges, even when they remain unanswered or persist. Angels of Destruction the concept of angels of destruction refers to angels depicted in the Bible as agents of divine judgment, tasked with carrying out punitive actions on behalf of God. One notable instance is found in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, where two angels were sent to execute God's judgment on these cities due to their widespread wickedness. These angels played a crucial role in facilitating the escape of Lot and his family before the cities were ultimately destroyed. In the context of the Exodus narrative, angels are associated with plagues that afflicted Egypt and these plagues served as divine judgment, so the angels played a role in their execution, bringing about various forms of destruction to compel Pharaoh to release the Israelites. And of course, the book of Revelation further explores the involvement of angels in divine judgment, as in Revelation 8, angels are given trumpets and their sounding results in catastrophic events on earth, symbolizing the unfoldment of God's final judgment. While the specific term, angels of destruction, may not be like said in the Bible, I think the idea just reflects the portrayals of angels destroying civilizations for God's sake and our sake. Parties. Parties is a term that has significance in Jewish mysticism, particularly in Kabbalah. The word parties is an acronym derived from four Hebrew words, each representing a level of interpretation and understanding of sacred texts. And I'll just go by them one by one. So the first one's Pasha. This refers to the straightforward literal interpretation of texts it involves understanding the surface meaning of words and narratives without delving into deeper symbolic or allegorical meanings. This level focuses on the basic understanding of what the text conveys. Next is Ramez. Ramez involves looking for hints, allegories, or symbolic meanings within the text. This goes beyond literal interpretation and seeks to uncover hidden or deeper messages that could be conveyed through symbols, metaphors, or illusions. Drash involves interpreting the text for moral, ethical, or homiletical lessons. This level explores the application of the text teachings to daily life, drawing lessons and insights that are relevant to personal or communal growth. Midrashic literature often falls within the realm of drash and sod. Sod is the last level. This is like esoteric or mystical, and these are the type of aspects it delves into. This level is more concerned with uncovering the secret or esoteric meanings that could be concealed within the words that are used, said in said text. It is often the most profound and symbolic level. The party system as a whole reflects a multi-layered approach to understanding sacred texts, acknowledging that scriptures can convey meanings at various depths. And this framework is widely used in Jewish study. Angels manifesting as physical archetypes. So this concept involves the idea that these spiritual beings can take on recognizable forms 
often appearing in human-like shapes. In the Bible, angels are described as messengers of God, and at times, they assume forms that make their presence more relatable to humans. For instance, in the story of Abraham, angels appear as visitors in human form, emphasizing their adaptability to the understanding of those they interact with. The manifestation of angels as archetypical representations extends to the idea that they may adopt symbols or forms with specific cultural or religious significance. This is God's camp. So this phrase suggests the acknowledgement of a sacred space, but I guess a better way to put this is when you're at a location that is considered consecrated under the divine presence, you would say this like a church or a, a gathering for your church. Because obviously you guys are all here under the pretense that you're from the same church community of people that praise the Lord. The destruction of death in Hades. So this refers to a biblical concept particularly found in the book of Revelation. This connects to the end times narrative depicting a transformative event where death and Hades, symbolizing the realm of the dead, are eradicated or overcome. In Revelation 2014, it is written, then death and Hades were thrown into a lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. This verse is part of a larger passage that describes the final judgment and the culmination of God's plan for humanity. The imagery used symbolizes the ultimate victory of God over death in the realm of dead. The destruction of death in Hades in this context signifies the abolition of power of death and the end of separation between God and humanity. It, it's like a theological expression in the belief of resurrection and the eternal life promised to those who believed. The idea is rooted in the Christian understanding of Christ's victory over death through his resurrection and the assurance in that, in the end, death will be completely conquered by all, and we will all live eternal lives. Ananias and Sapphira So Ananias and Sapphira are figures mentioned in the New Testament of the Bible, specifically in the book of Acts chapter 4 and 5. They're known for an incident that highlights the importance of honesty and integrity within the Christian community. So according to this narrative, after the resurrection of Jesus, the early Christian community in Jerusalem practiced communal living, where believers shared their possessions and resources. Ananias and Sapphira sold a piece of property, but they decided to keep a portion of the money for themselves while pretending to donate the full amount to the community. When Ananias presented the partial proceeds to the apostles, the apostle Peter confronted him. Then Peter asked Ananias why Satan had filled his heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the money. Peter explained that he wasn't lying, man, I just, I was just lying to God. After hearing those words, Ananias fell down and he was, he was instantly dead. And then Sapphira arrived and Peter was like, the same thing gonna happen to you for lying. And she died as well and they died together. This is just a quick story in the Bible that reminds you to not be dishonest and especially not to lie in the Lord's name. And here we enter the final tier, tier five. These were hard to find because again, no God, I just had to research everything on my own and try to decipher what he meant by these. But with that being said, let's get into it and call it a day. Mystics attempting to enter heaven inflicted with madness and epilepsy. So this entry kind of implies that people who are facing madness and epilepsy and kind of problems like that that make you go bonkers are the ones who are having face-to-face -face encounters with divine beings. I'm going to go over two cases in this entry. So the first was Teresa, the schizophrenic patient, describing Jesus appearing in her garden and bedroom. And she details his facial features and says that she literally felt the divine presence caressing her heart. And Ricardo, an epileptic patient, believes that he transformed into Jesus Christ, experiencing a direct encounter with God in heaven. So, yeah, it's a strange entry. This is the best I could get out of it. But it implies that these mental illnesses are gateways to meeting the divine. And a lot of stories do explore this idea because they're just not ordinary states of mind. People can perceive them as transcendence or enlightenment, whereas other people call it madness and crazy. That's kind of what this is all getting at here. Jesus mistaken for Metatron by the Rabbis in the Talmud. So this is a dangerous entry to cover, so I'm going to play it as safe as I can and just read all the notes I got out of it. 
So Metatron is depicted with the attributes and roles that in some ways resemble divine characteristics similar to Jesus. However, Jesus is mocked in the Talmud, so that's kind of where I reached my dead end here. If I had to shoot at a true explanation, I'd say that with this being a Christianity iceberg and all, that the creator of this list is trying to say that Metatron was actually the same Jesus that the Talmud mocks, but in a more different, powerful form when he makes his appearance. I'm just tiptoeing around this idea, don't get mad at me in the comments, I'm not sure what it means, try my best. Water, water illusion in the heavens. So this entry seems to be related to a specific interpretation of the biblical verses, suggesting that the existence of a water vapor layer above the earth's atmosphere before the biblical flood. This is positing that this water vapor played a role in creating a globally warm and tropical climate and it fell onto earth during the flood as described in the Genesis. This concept is based on verses like Genesis 1-7, through which mentions the division of waters above and below the firmament, 2 Peter 3-5-6, through which discusses the destruction of the world by water, and Proverbs 8-27-28 is also cited, referring to the preparation of the heavens and the watery deep. Christ changes appearance after his resurrection. The idea that Jesus changed his appearance after his resurrection is not really mentioned in the Bible. As close as I can get to this is in the Gospel of Luke, Luke 24, 36-43, where Jesus appears to his disciples and they initially believe that he's a spirit. And to prove that he's not a ghost, Jesus shows them his hands and feet and he eats in their presence to demonstrate the physical reality of his being. While the Gospels never mention a change in Jesus' appearance, there are some non-canonical texts and later traditions that include stories suggesting a transformed or glorified presence. Visual release hallucinations are demons and angels. Visual release hallucinations are a type of hallucination that occurs during the transition between wakefulness and sleep. These hallucinations are often vivid and can involve the perception of various images, scenes, or figures. And in different cultural religious contexts, people may attribute these hallucinations to supernatural or spiritual entities, including demons or angels. And this also involves sleep paralysis. So everything you see in between waking up and sleeping and vice versa is said to be demons or angels within the context of this entry. I've never had sleep paralysis or really any troubles waking up and going back to sleep, so I don't know if I can confirm or deny this. Lastly, reports of aliens and UFOs fleeing after hearing the name of Jesus. This has to be a joke entry because I could not find anything about it and I was looking for like 20 minutes of my life looking for UFOs and Jesus running away from one another or something like that. I felt so stupid. And with that, we conclude the Bible and Christianity iceberg I hope to find a better one in the future. I probably will and just do another Bible and Christianity iceberg because this one required a lot of just like filling in the blanks. It was very annoying and frustrating. With that being said, thank you so much for watching all the way through, guys. I appreciate every single one of you and I will catch you all in the next one. And uh, if you have any suggestions, leave them down below.